Dean Seidlinger, the health officer and state epidemiologist. Thank you, Dean. And I'm Dr. Robert Jackman, a family medicine physician and chief of the medical staff at Skylix Medical Center in Klamath Falls. And we're here today to answer your questions about breakthrough cases and more specifically to provide a profile on the disease landscape now that vaccines are abundant and available. A breakthrough case occurs when a person tests positive for COVID-19 at least 14 days after the final dose of a COVID-19 vaccine series. A bit later in the presentation, I can tell you my story and the impacts we've seen and what we're seeing now here in Klamath Falls. Thanks, Dr. Jackman. Let me start by providing a brief overview of the situation in Oregon. The surge of infections and hospitalizations that we saw a few weeks ago has receded as more people have gotten vaccinated. This is not a coincidence. More than 2.3 million Oregonians have received at least one dose of vaccine and more than 2.1 million are now fully vaccinated. Thank you to everyone who has taken the time and the effort to get vaccinated. And that has created a stark picture of two pandemics. One is a pandemic that is dying out amongst people who are vaccinated. The other is a pandemic that is raging amongst people who are unvaccinated or have yet to be vaccinated. Last month, OHA posted the latest report on breakthrough cases amongst people who are vaccinated in May. The report found that 98% of the 16,097 COVID-19 cases recorded in May were amongst those who are unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated, 98%. More than nine in 10 COVID-19 deaths occurred amongst people who are unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated. When we look at data between March 1st and May 31st, 98% of COVID-19 patients who filled hospital beds were either not vaccinated or had not yet been fully vaccinated, and 94% of COVID-19 associated deaths were amongst the unvaccinated. Data from Sky Lakes here in Klamath Falls is essentially the same. Of 103 admissions since April, 95% were unvaccinated. In addition, 96% of the COVID-related deaths we've had were unvaccinated. And as a colleague of mine once said, vaccines save lives. It's as simple as that. The data clearly show that if you are fully vaccinated, you can have confidence that a get-together with friends, a day at work alongside others, won't put you at high risk to contract or pass COVID-19 on to others. But if you're unvaccinated, the threat of the virus still looms large. You remain vulnerable to getting sick or worse becoming seriously ill yourself or passing the virus to someone who might wind up in the hospital or even dying. You can see the same dynamic playing out at the county level. Over the past month, most counties with high vaccination rates among adults have also tended to have lower infection rates. Let me talk about what we're seeing here at Skylakes Medical Center and the potential threat it offers patients seeking critical medical care. Skylakes is somewhat isolated. We're the, we're the only hospital within about 100 miles from many places, so we're essentially the only large hospital for a large part of southeastern Oregon. When we're taking care of COVID-19 patients, we're unable to care for people who need non-COVID care. This will become more important as we deal with the variants. People who are unvaccinated are especially vulnerable to infection from these mutations. That means we have the potential for another surge unless people are vaccinated. So what does this have to do with breakthrough cases? Besides being a practicing family physician and one of the first people to be vaccinated here just before uh, Christmas, I'm one of the few breakthrough cases in Oregon. Despite all my precautions, I still became infected. Because of my vaccination though, my experience of COVID-19 was much less severe than most of the patients I've cared for in our isolation unit. My symptoms from COVID-19 only lasted about eight hours and they were not much worse than the very mild and minor side effects I experienced from my second vaccine. I can tell you from firsthand experience, the vaccinations work. I also implore you to get vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Jackman. And I'm so glad you're feeling better and your story really does illustrate that vaccines work. Before we get to your questions, let me address a few additional issues we've seen on our social media stream. One of them is the issue of vaccine-induced immunity versus natural immunity. If you've had COVID and recovered, you may not have the same level of immunity as someone who has not been infected and has not been fully vaccinated. It is also unknown how long that protection will last. 
So people who have recovered from the disease, while they have a robust, people who have recovered from the disease have a robust response to the vaccine. And that's more evidence that it's recommended that you get the vaccine to really increase your protection. And in all cases, it's better to have immunity from COVID-19 without being sickened by it. The disease can be deadly and even moderate infections can result in long-term and serious complications that can cause damage to the heart, kidneys, brain, and lungs that we're only just now beginning to learn about. We've also seen a lot of social media chatter on the emerging COVID-19 variants in Oregon. We know that the existing vaccines are effective at preventing serious illness and death from COVID-19 and all its variants currently circulating in Oregon. Some people are expressing concerns about the side effects from the vaccine. Many people will experience no side effects at all. Some will have pain or minor swelling at the injection site, fevers, chills, or a headache. There are rare occasions when people suffer adverse effects. Our nationwide system for safely monitoring vaccines is robust. Adverse events, even those that are very rare, are flagged by the National Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, or VAERS, and the frequency of these reports is extremely low. Amongst those are reports of myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle following COVID-19 vaccine. OHA has asked healthcare providers to be on lookout for symptoms of myocarditis in people who have been vaccinated. And our partners at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has not established a connection between COVID-19 vaccination and this condition, but they're meeting about that right now. And we hope to have some additional answers to provide guidance to individuals. COVID-19 has proven to be a resilient enemy. The COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective. They were exhaustively tested in clinical trials and that efficacy is reflected in the data we see here in Oregon. So I urge all of you to make a plan to get vaccinated if you're not already vaccinated. We're ready for your questions now and we wanna make sure we get to as many as possible. So we're only gonna be taking questions on this topic today on vaccine breakthrough cases. Thank you, doctors. First question is from Marie. Are you tracking which vaccine the breakthrough cases are happening with? Thank you, Marie. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the full data on that. We know we've seen breakthrough cases amongst um, all the vaccines. Um, but they all work very well. Again, through the month of May, um, which is the last month that we have complete data for, we've only seen 1,009 COVID-19 breakthrough cases. This is amongst almost 1.85 million people who are vaccinated at that time. The people getting sick continue to be the people not fully vaccinated. And I, hope, and I know down here in Klamath Falls, all of our breakthrough cases are referred for testing and uh, genetic analysis. Thank you. The next question is from Rachel. Is there a breakdown of breakthrough cases by vaccine? I would I think... imagine yes. I can't imagine that that's not happening. I haven't seen the actual data, but it, it would be pretty easy, I think, to figure that out given the low number of cases, 1,009, as Dean just mentioned. And again, I don't have those specific numbers, but know that it's very rare to get um, COVID-19 after you're fully vaccinated, regardless of which vaccine you got. It's amazing the year and a half um, after um, first pace, facing this pandemic, we have very safe and very effective vaccines that as of this moment have gone into the arms of over 2 million Oregonians. And this is what's gonna help us end this pandemic. Next question is from Shelby. Why get the vaccine if you can still get COVID? Well, I guess I'm a case that that can happen, but what I can say is if you do uh, get COVID after having the vaccine, it's not going to be as severe as if you hadn't had the vaccine. I would say I had very, very few symptoms, but being a healthcare provider, I was really on top of paying attention to my symptoms. I had a dry cough for about an hour and it was very mild. And then I got home and I was a little sore, minimally sore. Went in that night to get a test and it was positive and I was kind of surprised. Um, later that night, I had more severe muscle aches, but they weren't as severe as the side effects I had from my second vaccine dose, which I wouldn't say was very severe to begin with. The next morning when I woke up, felt fine. So even though it can happen, the severe cases are prevented, 
deaths are prevented. So I do encourage you to get your vaccine anyway. Whether you've had COVID first and you're unvaccinated or you've been vaccinated and get COVID, great. But if you're not vaccinated, just get your vaccine. It will help you. Yeah, and, and let me put that in a little other perspective. In May, 98% of our COVID cases were not fully vaccinated. So if you're vaccinated, you likely aren't gonna show up in that number, that daily count that we put out. These are individuals who had not yet been fully vaccinated. It prevents not only COVID, but also prevents you from getting seriously ill from COVID um, and even um, dying from COVID. Vaccine is your safest, most effective method to um, getting through this pandemic without getting COVID. It's not 100%, but it's just about as close as any vaccine can get to fully protecting you from COVID. Thank you. The next question is from Cheryl. Does this take into account natural immunity? Cheryl, let me take that question. When we talk about breakthrough cases, we're only talking about cases that occurred in individuals who are fully vaccinated, one dose of Johnson & Johnson or two doses of Pfizer and Moderna, and have had at least 14 days since their final vaccination. That's what the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and OHA label as a breakthrough case. Certainly, individuals who recover from COVID-19 have some immunity to the virus. We don't know how long-lasting or strong that is. We don't know how that immunity will protect against variants that are emerging now, but we do have evidence for the vaccines. Vaccines work against these emerging variants. And what we also know is that those individuals who've recovered from vaccine have a robust response to immunizations when they get it. So vaccines offer them robust protection as well. Natural immunity does exist for some people, um, but it comes at a cost, the cost of potentially getting seriously ill. Um, COVID-19 vaccinations can prevent that and can even offer protection to those who are already um, recovered from the disease. And Dean, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I thought I saw some early evidence uh, months ago in the uh, pandemic that the natural immunity is not quite as high or as strong as the vaccination immunity. Certainly on some of the, the research studies that have come out that, that indicates that. Um, it's difficult to fully predict that immunity in the real world because it's not just the antibodies that can be easily measured in the lab, but the cells that are formed in your body that can respond to a vaccine and, or that can respond um, to a future infection. And we have a lot more data about how effective vaccines are. Right now we have data out about seven or eight months that they still work as, um, almost as well as when you got them, that they work against the variants, maybe a little less than some, but work very well. We don't have that same robust level of data about natural immunity, how long it lasts, and um, how it protects against emerging variants. Next question is from Cindy. Can you please let us know for each death whether the person has been vaccinated? While um, reporting the vaccine status of individuals is hard at, at the time of their death in, in a timely fashion, what we do know that it's a very small number of our deaths um, that we're seeing now that the vaccine is available that are in people who are fully vaccinated. In May, we saw 126 um, individuals who died from COVID. And my thoughts go out to all the loved ones who are left behind. But of those 126 individuals, 91% of the deaths were in unvaccinated individuals. So less than one in 10 of those deaths were in fully vaccinated individuals. So the fact is that when we report those deaths each day, um, most of those deaths are in people who are not fully vaccinated. And unfortunately, the, the same was here in Klamath Falls. Almost all of our deaths have been in unvaccinated individuals, which is sad to say. Question from Renee, is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine protective against the Delta variant? Thanks, Renee. I haven't seen specific data on a large scale around the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the Delta variant. The data we have about vaccine effectiveness, how well vaccines work, right now the best data we have against the Delta variant is data that comes out of the UK. And what we see in that data is that um, after a single dose of Pfizer, there's a fairly significant reduction in vaccine effectiveness. But after two doses, um, the protection has only dropped a little bit. They don't use the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but they use a vaccine with a similar mechanism um, from AstraZeneca, and a similar situation was seen there. Vaccine effectiveness dropped off some, but still offered significant protection after two doses. 
we imagine the same data will come out um, from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And vaccines are your most effective um, way of protecting yourself. So get a vaccine when you're eligible. Talk to your friends and families about getting a vaccine because it does offer significant protection, even against the Delta variant. Question from Liz, what about boosters? Well, I would imagine that we will be getting a booster at least every year, just like we do with the flu shot. I know Pfizer is developing um, a booster vaccine right now. It may have to happen even more frequently, but I would imagine that there'll be yearly boosters. Yeah, and I, I think there's still a lot of unknowns in there. I think many people are predicting that we may need a booster if we start to see the immunity from the current vaccine um, waning or going away, or if we have the emergence of variants that don't respond to that, but it's just unknown now. Right now, what we know is vaccines continue to offer robust protection through about eight months, that vaccines are working against the variants we've identified. If either um, of those don't continue to hold true, we could see a booster develop and that booster will need to be given to individuals, maybe on an annual basis, maybe on a one-time basis, but we'll know more as we learn. Right now, get the vaccines we have. They're very protective against what's circulating in the state of Oregon. Question from Jennifer, how long should people wait to get vaccinated after they've been sick with COVID? I think some of that depends on whether or not you are treated with a, a medication called monoclonal antibodies. If that's the case, you need to wait longer um, because the vaccine won't be as effective while the monoclonal antibodies that you receive are still in your body. Um, if you're recovering from COVID um, and have not if you've recovered from COVID and not yet received those vaccines and which you have to wait 90 days for, um, you can get vaccinated sooner. And correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think it's 10 days after recovery, as short as that. I believe you're, you are correct. Once your symptoms have, have resolved and, and you've been at least 10 days, um, you can safely get the COVID-19 vaccine and have protection. Um, but the difference will be, again, if you get monoclonal antibodies, you need to wait about three months. Here's a question from Rachel. How is breakthrough data gathered at testing or treatment or with hospitalization? Thank you for that question. I'll, what we do is in, in all our cases um, that were diagnosed with COVID-19, including those who've been hospitalized and, and died, um, we match up those records with records we have in the um, immunization registry to determine if people receive vaccines, if they'd received both doses of a two vaccine, if they'd received a two dose series, and how long it's been since their last vaccine so that we can determine um, who has been identified as a case has been fully vaccinated. It takes some time to match up all that data and to um, compile that report, which is why we do so on a monthly basis to give you an idea of how those cases are occurring in Oregon. And they've continued over the last um, few months to be a very small percentage of our cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Melody also has a question. Where are the breakthrough cases occurring? Through community spread or close contacts? Again, I'll, I'll take that from a statewide perspective. We're seeing breakthrough cases kind of across the state. There are certain settings where people are getting tested more frequently for conditions of employment around healthcare and long-term care, where we may pick up more breakthrough cases that are asymptomatic. That's not necessary because we think there's significantly more disease there, um, but we are doing more testing. Um, but right now we can say that if you're fully vaccinated, no matter what your profession, where you are in the state, you're gonna be very well protected because breakthrough cases are just a small percentage of cases that occur in the community. Some through community spread, some through spread um, in healthcare settings and others. Um, but again, there are very few, a very small number of our cases. Question from Olivia. There was data showing that natural immunity from other SARS viruses can last up to 17 years. Why should we assume that immunity from this SARS virus is, is different? But I don't think we can assume that, but we don't really have the data at this point. And as, as we collect more data, we might be able to more accurately answer that question for you. And I would just add that SARS is caused by a, a type of virus called a coronavirus. The coronavirus is a large family that causes 
different kinds of disease. Some people may re remember SARS from an infection that started in China um, close to two decades ago. We saw spread in some various other communities um, throughout the world. Um, but SARS has essentially gone away as an infection amongst humans. It wasn't very easily transmitted from person to person. And some studies do suggest that those individuals maintain an immune response to the coronavirus that caused SARS. Other coronaviruses can cause the common cold and more mi minor symptoms. And all of, us, all of us who've had a cold know that we can get cold over and over again, even with the same coronavirus. So we don't know with this coronavirus how long natural immunity will last after the virus. Um, but what we do know is that the current immunity following vaccine lasts at least eight months and is continued to be studied and doesn't show any signs of waning. Um, so getting a vaccine is your best protection, especially in the face of an unknown length of natural immunity. Jenna's question is, do you have any sense of how clean the data is? I.e. when folks complete their injections, are they strongly advised to continue getting tested if they come down with respiratory symptoms? Or is it possible that mild breakthrough cases are not being logged because folks assume they're immune and therefore don't get tested? Thanks for that question. As we know with SARS-CoV-2 um, viral infections, COVID-19, many people never have symptoms or very mild symptoms that they might not seek care. But we encourage anyone um, with symptoms of COVID-19 to seek testing. That being said, there are gonna be people, again, with no symptoms or mild symptoms who never come in for care and never get tested. Um, but what the studies show us is those people who've been vaccinated, even if they have mild disease, can't easily transmit it to others. Um, so they do offer protection to those around them. What we do know is that in certain settings where people are getting tested routinely for travel or for their occupation, we tend to pick up more asymptomatic or mild um, mildly symptomatic infections, um, but we don't pick up all of them. Um, but certainly what we know about the vaccine is it offers great protection and you should get it if you haven't already. Question from Rachel, is there any data on whether breakthrough cases are more frequent in immuno, immunocompromised people? I haven't, I haven't seen any data regarding this. I don't know if you have, Dean. Now, what we know about people who are immunocompromised, there can be varying levels of the functioning of their immune system, and that some may not respond as well um, to vaccines, and so may still be at risk for SARS-CoV-2 infection following vaccination. If you're immunocompromised because of cancer treatment, treatment with steroids, um, because of HIV or another reason, talk to your healthcare provider about your risk protections you can still take after the um, vaccination and whether the vaccination is the best step for you, um, because we know that many people could still be at risk and need to take some additional precautions, like continuing to wear their masks and limiting their gatherings in large um, crowds um, where they don't know the vaccination status of others. Laura has a question. I, I noticed you hardly ever mentioned pediatric cases. Once 12 and up were eligible, you admitted that there had been several pediatric surgeries and that cases in that age range were a big problem. Shouldn't parents of younger children be aware of that risk level. Oh, this is great. Thanks for bringing this up, Laura. Yeah, I think uh, pediatric cases we don't focus on enough. Kids, they, they get the infection and they're asymptomatic more frequently, but they can hold the infection and pass it on uh, to people who would get more ill from the condition. And I think as we uh, develop vaccines more and more for children, I would encourage everybody to get their children vaccinated. Um, I think this is a risk level we should be very, very aware of, and I'm glad you brought it up. And I think when we talk about COVID-19 in children, there's a few things to remember. COVID-19 affects children much less than adults. Children who develop COVID-19 tend to be more likely to be asymptomatic or have mild symptoms but a subset do develop more serious conditions, a condition we call MIS-C or multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. This is rare, um, but it does occur. Deaths amongst children from COVID-19 are also rare, but when we put it in perspective against the flu, we've seen more children die of COVID-19 than die from influenza in a typical year. And that's why the push has been on um, to have safe and effective vaccines in children 
while the disease is less serious in children than in adults, as you heard from Jack, Dr. Jackman, they can pass it on to those around them who may become seriously ill, and a small subset of children do become seriously ill, and some may develop long-lasting symptoms. So now we have a vaccine that's approved, that's authorized um, for those 12 and up. It is safe and it is effective. Um, and so I would encourage parents of children in that age range um, to get vaccines. And I would encourage children to ask your parents, um, seek out information um, from your doctor, your healthcare provider about the vaccine um, so that you can make that decision. And later this year or in the future, we may have a vaccine for even younger children and we await that data coming out to see um, if that's available. Question from Renee, could someone who received the, J, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine three months ago also get a Pfizer or Moderna dose to help increase protection against breakthrough cases? This, this uh, I'll take that, uh, great question. Uh, this might be more important in other countries. I think here where we have an abundance of availability of vaccines, I would probably recommend sticking with the vaccine you started with, um, not getting multiple vaccines. If you have a one dose series and that's the completion, I don't think there are any recommendations to get a second independent vaccine. Um, in other countries where someone starts with the Pfizer vaccine and finishes with the Moderna vaccine, it seems to be effective and not problematic, but it, I have not heard of any recommendations in our country to do this. So right now, if you're fully vaccinated, either with two doses of Pfizer or two doses of Moderna or a single dose of Johnson & Johnson, you have great protection against the diseases circulating in the community. Um, we know that there are studies going on for boosters, mixing doses and other things that may help us down the line if we see vaccine immunity waning or, or going away, or if we see variants that aren't really working, um, that the vaccine isn't working to protect us from. Um, so for now, if you got a Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you're protected. If you got the Moderna vaccine, you're protected. If you've got the Pfizer vaccine, you're protected. Yes, yeah, so we have a question here, uh, and a last question from our uh, Spanish Facebook page. If a person received a first dose in another country with a different vaccine than the ones offered here in the US, can you later get vaccinated here? And how long do you have to wait to do it? Thank you. If you've started a vaccine in another country and that vaccine is not currently available in the United States, we would recommend getting one of the authorized vaccines here in the United States, a single dose of Johnson & Johnson, two doses of Pfizer, or two doses of Moderna. If you received um, a full series of vaccines in a foreign country that were authorized in that country, you shouldn't need to get revaccinated when you're here. Um, if someone doesn't wanna restart a series Using like vaccines, mRNA vaccines um, with an mRNA vaccine may work, but we just don't have that data. So again, if you haven't fully completed your series, try to complete it with the one you started. If not, start with one of the vaccines that's authorized here in the United States to make sure that you have the best protection. And with that, that's our final question. So I wanna thank all of you for joining us today on this really important topic. We know we've all been suffering through the impacts of COVID-19, both some of us who've been ill ourselves or had family members who've been ill or lost loved ones, the economic impacts, the impacts on our social emotional being, spending a lot more time at home, juggling, schooling, working, and, and um, all our other activities all at the same time. Um, but now that we have vaccines um, that are effective and safe, we know this is our way back to a more normal life back to the way things were in 2019. So if you've been vaccinated, thank you, you're protected. If you haven't been vaccinated, make a plan, talk to your provider, look for a reliable source um, online. OHA has information, your provider has information, the CDC has information and make a plan to get vaccinated. Um, with that, again, thank you for participating in our Facebook Live. Stay well and have a great day. Thank you for allowing me to participate as well, and please get vaccinated.